Computers are at the foundation of the modern globalized economy, and their roots lie in the 19th century in an unexpected way with the punch card. Now, punch cards were invented to control looms, a special kind of loom called a jacquard loom that could be programmed to produce a wide array of different kinds of weaving patterns. And even in the late 19th century, the census used, again, punch cards to keep track of the American population. But these machines were not computers. They were not able to do complex calculations on this data. At best, they were adding machines. And the best company that produced these adding machines by World War II was a company called International Business Machines, or IBM. In the 1940s, IBM had 90% of the punch card market in America. And so during World War II, when American and British scientists tried to figure out a way to store data from a new kind of actual computer called ENIAC that used vacuum tubes from radios to begin to do calculations, they used punch cards made by IBM. And so these computers during World War II were used for two purposes. First, the decryption of, British, of German communications using those Enigma machines to decrypt those, and also the calculation of missile trajectories and rocket trajectories and all the other kinds of complex calculations that go along with modern artillery. Coming out of World War II then, it was a natural fit for IBM to become the developer of new kinds of commercially useful business computers. Computers that would use vacuum tubes on the one hand and its own punch cards on the other. After the war, there was a search for a new kind of device that could perform the logic that was possible with vacuum tubes, but without their very fragile nature. The breakthrough came in the late 1950s at Bell Labs where William Shockley invented the transistor. Now, Bell Labs was owned by AT&T, and so they were very afraid already of being investigated for antitrust in the sense that they controlled the American telecommunications industry. And so AT&T decided to license out the transistor to Raytheon, to Zenith, to RCA, to Texas Instruments, to a range of different electronics firms who would all produce these new kinds of chips. In the late 1950s then, the transistor began to find its way into the computer through IBM. The CEO of IBM, Tom Watson, at four, before a assembled gathering of the top executives, the 100 top executives, handed out uh, these transistor radios produced by Texas Instruments. He said to the group, if that little outfit there in Texas can make these radios work for that kind of money, they can make transistors that will make our computers work too. And so this transition to the transistor computer that came in the early 1960s created a boom in the industry. In 1960, there were only 6,000 mainframes in the country, and by 1968, there were 67,000. But these were for business, for business problems. And in doing so, IBM remade not only itself, but the entirety of American capitalism. IBM was clever in how it operated its business. Instead of selling the computers outright, it simply leased them to the corporations and then sold them punch cards. And so they had a huge markup on the punch cards, which were, of course, just paper. And at any moment, if they tried to switch to some other purveyor of punch cards, they could pull back their computers. And so doing so, they locked in the largest corporations into their business model. But these computers could do more than the adding machines of pre-World War II. They could do more than count. For instance, in 1964, IBM released a Sabre, semi-automatic business research environment, which allowed these new jet airlines to coordinate ticket sales and hotel reservations. It's the very first real-time transaction system, and in many risk regards, the forerunner of today's internet commerce. And so for the jet age, computers matter. They made those real-time global connections possible. In 1964, IBM introduces its breakthrough product, the first computer that separates the operating system, that is the software, from the hardware. It was called System 360. Now, it was exciting because it was a stable computer that could be used with many different kinds of peripherals. So whether you worked at the Atomic Energy Commission or the NSA, you could hook up your different kinds of specialized devices. 
and it's the most successful product since the Model T. It produces 30% annual growth for IBM. And this is a company that already has a multi-billion dollar revenue. And so this is a tremendous explosion and it marks the maturation of the electronics industry into the forefront of American capitalism. IBM was very successful. So successful, in fact, that companies in other parts of the world begin to buy them. So what IBM begins to do is look for ways to actually have the final assembly step, the step that adds the least value, as opposed to manufacturing the chips and all those other steps, take place close to the customer. And so especially for Asian customers, which are so far away, they, they decided to set up assembly plants in Asia itself, completing that last lowest value added step. Now this happens in the 1960s, and in many ways is the mirror image of what begins to happen in the 1980s, as we'll come to in a few minutes, talking about the rise of Asian automobile manufacturing.